If you or your partner are thinking about conceiving anytime soon, or you're pregnant, this video is for you. Sit down and take a listen, learn about all of the different genetic testing options that should be available to you. So if you are interested in any of them, you can bring them up with your provider and learn a little bit more. It's me, Katie Lee, CGC, and welcome back to my channel. If you haven't already, please like this video and subscribe to my channel. Ring the notification bell so you can be updated when I release a video about pregnancy, fertility, miscarriage, and all things related to that. Today, I'm going to be covering all of those genetic testing options that are available to you prior to conception or during pregnancy in 2021. There are so many options on the buffet table when it comes to genetic testing these days, and it can be really confusing. Sometimes your provider may forget to offer one to you. So I'm here to tell you what all of those test options are and explain a little bit about why you might want to consider each. So first up, let's talk about preconception genetic testing, testing that you can do before you conceive to gather additional information. The one test that's probably applicable to every single person out there is called carrier screening. Carrier screening is a genetic test. It just uses a blood sample or a saliva sample from the egg source and the sperm source or the people who are going to be conceiving. And using that DNA sample, you can figure out if you are a carrier of any number of genetic diseases. Now, I'm not gonna spend too long going into exactly how different carrier screens vary because there's a lot of different competitors out there and carrier screening has evolved significantly over the past 10, 15 years. Essentially these days, when you do carrier screening, you're usually getting screened for hundreds of recessive diseases. So those recessive diseases, you should remember from ninth grade biology, those are the diseases where both the egg source and the sperm source have to be carriers of the same disease in order to have a chance to have an affected child. Examples of these conditions would be things like cystic fibrosis, sickle cell disease, Tay-Sachs disease, and the list could go on and on and on. There are thousands of recessive diseases known to humankind. Carrier screening will look for typically a couple hundred of the most common autosomal recessive diseases. And most of us will come back a carrier of at least a few things. Both me and my partner are carriers of at least one thing. And it is normal to be a carrier. When you're a carrier, it means that one of your copies of that specific gene is mutated or has a variant and isn't functioning, but the other copy is. And because this other copy is functioning, it is essentially making up for the broken copy of the gene. So being a carrier, being a carrier generally does not affect your health. The only time that it matters is with reproduction, when you have a 50% chance of passing on your broken gene, and if your partner over here also has a broken gene, he has a 50% chance of his passing on, and therefore a 25% chance to have an affected child. So carrier screening is testing you should consider before pregnancy. You can get it done with your OBGYN, you can get it done with a primary care physician, um, and there's some other ways to access it too. That is a very simple description of carrier screening. I'm gonna link some of my favorite carrier screening companies down below. I'm linking Myriad and Semaphore. So you can check out both of those. Now this next type of preconception testing is not really a specific test, but rather it's the idea that if you have something genetic, hereditary in your family, or something you suspect might be hereditary in your family, whether that's a long line of young cancers that have affected individuals in your family, or it could be multiple family members that have been affected with a neurodegenerative disease like early onset Parkinson's disease or Huntington's disease. If you have a history of that and you want to know if you have an increased risk for that condition and if you have an increased risk to pass it on to your offspring, preconception would be a great time to consider meeting with a provider, probably a specialist in whatever area of medicine that specific disease might fall into and figuring out if there's any genetic testing that you could consider to determine whether or not you carry a variant that puts you at a significantly increased risk for the disease. And then therefore, if you have a chance of passing that variant onto your children. Now, not everyone wants to know this type of information, especially for adult onset diseases, 
but it can be really helpful because sometimes knowing whether or not you have a variant can help your doctor tell you exactly what type of screening would be best to diagnose a specific condition like a cancer early. And sometimes it can help guide treatment as well. If you're worried about your family history, just start by talking to your primary care provider and they should be able to tell you whether it's concerning and potentially refer you to a provider if they think that genetic testing or a follow-up conversation would be worthwhile. Okay, we're moving into the next group of preconception genetic tests, which is the world of PGT, the world of pre-implantation genetic testing. What does that mean? Pre-implantation, that means before an embryo is implanted into the uterus, it is tested with genetic testing. PGT is only available to people who are utilizing IVF or open to utilizing IVF. IVF stands for in vitro fertilization. So that would be the method of conceiving where eggs are retrieved from an egg source's body. They're fertilized in a laboratory, grown in an embryology laboratory for a number of days, and then the embryos are transferred back into the uterus. So hopefully a person conceives. When you utilize IVF, there is the potential to biopsy a small section of the embryo, use that little sample of cells, just a handful of cells, and to test for a number of things. And that test on a pre-implantation embryo, that's what's referred to as PGT. Now there are all different types of PGT, and I wanna go over each one briefly, and then I'm planning to make a more detailed video about each of these different types of tests in the future. So probably the most commonly utilized PGT is PGTA, pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy. This is when that sample of cells from the embryo is used to look for chromosome imbalances. So typically an embryo will contain 46 chromosomes. That is the normal number of chromosomes that most humans have. Sometimes an embryo will have missing or extra chromosomes, and that could cause things like Down syndrome or trisomy 21. Could also cause a significantly increased risk for miscarriage. So PGTA helps patients identify embryos that are chromosomally normal, and those are the embryos that would be recommended for transfer because they're gonna have the best chance for success. PGTM, another type of PGT. Pre-implantation genetic testing for monogenic diseases is the type of PGT where you can go and look for one single genetic change. So let's say that you yourself are affected with a BRCA1 mutation. BRCA mutations or BRCA variants are variants that cause an increased risk for breast cancer and ovarian cancer and a few other types of cancer. And it's a pretty significant increased risk. Some people who have a significantly increased risk to pass on a genetic variant to their offspring choose to test their embryos for that genetic condition. Another circumstance that you might utilize PGTM is if both the egg source and the sperm source do carrier screening and they're both found to be carriers of the same disease meaning they have a 25% chance each time they conceive to have an affected child. In that case, the couple could utilize PGTM to test for that specific disease, whether it's cystic fibrosis, sickle cell disease, or something else. The next type of PGT is PGTSR. This is probably utilized the least frequently of all of the PGTs I'm going to be talking about, and that's because it only applies to a really small subset of patients. Some people have something called a structural change in their chromosomes. This means that their chromosomes are oriented differently from typical. It could be the case that a small piece of the chromosome is inverted. It could be the case that two pieces of chromosomes switch places with each other, but either way, all of the genetic material is present, so it doesn't affect their health whatsoever, but it can affect their fertility. It can cause an increased risk for miscarriage or infertility. So people who have structural changes, known as translocations or inversions, can utilize PGTSR to identify embryos that are balanced, that have the normal amount of genetic material. Okay, and now the last type of PGT, and the newest type of PGT is PGTP. This is pre-implantation genetic testing for polygenic diseases. Polygenic diseases are diseases like schizophrenia or heart disease or diabetes, and the list could go on and on, but most of the most of the more common adult onset diseases we see in the general population are polygenic diseases. They're caused by multiple genes, probably hundreds of genes, and small genetic variants that you could have on these genes might increase or decrease your risk for some of these diseases. Importantly, the risk for these diseases is also often modulated by environmental factors, like our diet or our lifestyle. So with PGTP, an embryo biopsy is used 
to determine whether an embryo is at an increased risk for some of these polygenic diseases. Pre-implantation genetic testing for polygenic diseases, or PGTP, is by far the newest of all of these technologies, and we still have a lot to learn. Importantly, it can never eliminate the risk for any of these polygenic diseases, but the idea behind it is to rank your embryos as to which embryos might have the lowest risk for these types of diseases. Okay, switching gears, prenatal testing. What genetic testing options are available to you once you're pregnant? The earliest test that you can have done is called NIPT, non-invasive prenatal testing. You can check out my video link below where I share my NIPT results. This test is available as early as nine weeks of pregnancy, so really nice and early. And it can look for a handful of chromosome imbalances like Down syndrome or trisomy 21. And it can also determine the sex of the pregnancy. Certain NIPT laboratories also look for other things like small deletions within the chromosomes. Some of the nice things about NIPT are, one, it's available so early at just nine weeks of pregnancy, usually only takes about seven to 10 days to get your results back, and two, it just uses a blood draw, so it is completely non-invasive with no risk at all to the pregnancy. One of the cons is that it's not a perfect test. There is a risk for a misdiagnosis, so you could have a negative or a normal result and actually have an affected pregnancy. You could also have an abnormal result telling you you're at an increased risk for a specific disease, but your pregnancy could be perfectly fine. So for that reason, I would consider NIPT a screening test. Now, the other category of prenatal testing is diagnostic testing. Diagnostic testing has the highest level of accuracy. There are generally two diagnostic tests that are available in pregnancy. They are CVS and amniocentesis. CVS stands for chorionic villus sampling. That means that a small, small sample of the placenta is taken using a small, thin needle that's either inserted through the cervix to reach the placenta or through the abdomen, depending on where the placenta lies in the pregnancy. It can be done anywhere between, oh, about 11 to 13 weeks of pregnancy, give or take. You can use the sample that is collected with CVS to run all sorts of different genetic tests, whether you're looking for a specific genetic syndrome in the pregnancy, whether you want to screen for chromosome imbalances or something else. Amniocentesis is similar in that it uses a sample from the pregnancy, but in the case of amniocentesis, amniotic fluid is used. Amniotic fluid can be obtained by using a thin hollow needle that goes through the abdomen to collect some amniotic fluid. It's guided by an ultrasound, and within that amniotic fluid are fetal skin cells. Those fetal skin cells can be used to test for any number of genetic conditions. Now, the downside about CVS and amniocentesis is that there is a small, small risk for miscarriage following the procedure. You definitely want to talk to your OBGYN or the provider who will be performing that procedure to understand the risks and benefits to any of these tests. So that's it. There's my summary of genetic testing that is available to you prior to conceiving and once you actually conceive when you do have a pregnancy. If you have any questions about any of these tests, let me know down below. And most importantly, talk to your provider about each of these tests, what you're interested in, so you can learn more about the risks and the benefits of each of them.